As Pastor Andrew says, we're going to continue to worship by going into God's Word. If you would take out the Bibles that are close to you, and we're going to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. I'm going to read 1 through 11. Jesus calls his first disciples. And we are on page 962. 962. And when you are there, can you all smile? Okay. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the word of God for God's people. I'm grateful, Ken, for you standing up here to read this morning. I want to invite you to our next scripture reading. It's going to be from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, page 1017. And as you're turning there, I asked Ken if he would help me do a scripture reading this week. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, Ken, of course I'm sure. He's like, well, I'm not that great of a fisherman. And I said, well, I'm not either. So we have two bad fishermen that are reading about fishing this morning, and uh, I think it's fitting, however, in the ways in which we come to the very first moment Jesus calls his disciples to this moment here in the Gospel of John, chapter 21. I'm going to be reading verses 21 through 14, 21, 1 through 14, and the title of the message is One Last Cast. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Didymus means the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Then, when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals 
there were fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Then Jesus, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is God's word here in the Gospel of John, chapter 21 this morning. You know, as Ken joked with me about not being a good fisherman, I actually had an interpersonal moment to have an account of my own fishing skills, and I have none. In fact, the only fishing story I really, truly have is when Amy and I first met, and I was pastoring at Delmer and Elwood. Uh, there is a bunch of guys that would always do a catfish tournament every year on the Mississippi River. The very first time I took Amy fishing was on a boat with this gentleman, Kelly Keeney, and uh, we're fishing, having a great time, didn't catch anything, so we're heading back across the Mississippi, back into, you know, weigh all the fish that we didn't have and uh, enjoy the spoils of our uh, empty nets, and the boat began to spit and sputter. And it went from, how many fish can we catch, to, are we going to make it out of here alive? as we were putting across the Mississippi River and a barge is coming our way. And it was by the grace of God that we made it there. And I tell you what, we have never been so happy to never catch fish in our lives. We thought to ourselves, well, what if we had more weight? We, we, surely we wouldn't have made it. All those different kinds of things. But as you think for yourselves, many of us have memories of fishing, whether it's with a family member or a grandpa or a dad or mom or grandma, when you're a little tyke all the way up to now, maybe possibly making those memories with your own family. We all have a fishing story in one way or another. And so do the disciples as Ken read for us in the Gospel of Luke this morning, that first account is these disciples, the majority of them were professional and commercial fishermen. They were doing what they knew how to do best. And if you recall what happens in the Gospel of Luke, and Matthew also takes light to it as well, that the disciples didn't catch anything. And Jesus said, cast again. And as they brought the fish up. The nets were breaking. The boats were sinking. Simon Peter said, Lord, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Jesus says those famous words, you know, those bumper sticker words, from now on you will be fishers of men. And then from that point, for the next three years of their lives, they faithfully followed Jesus. Of course, they fell short of his glory. But now... Jesus, who was crucified on the cross, was buried in the tomb. He was resurrected. And as we know from our past couple of weeks, Jesus appeared to the disciples. You remember Jesus is in the, it meets the disciples in the upper room. And Thomas isn't there. And so Thomas comes back and all the other disciples are saying, we've seen the Lord. He's come. He's back. He's been resurrected. And Thomas is like, no, no, no. I, I need to see him with my own eyes. I need to be able to put my hands where his hands are and put my hand on his side. And Jesus comes again. We read that in the Gospel of John chapter 20 that when Jesus comes back to Peter, or to Peter and the rest of the disciples and to Thomas, Thomas believes. And Jesus says, blessed is the one who doesn't see me, yet still believes in me. And then the Gospel of John seems to wrap up there in chapter 20. As John says, there are many other th signs and miracles that Jesus did. So many that we wouldn't have the books to contain it. So then we come here to John 21. It's like, oh my goodness, John, I thought you ended your gospel. What is this whole John 21 about? Well, John 21 is essentially an encore. It is a continue. John, we need, we need something else. This can't be it. And if we recall, 
and Luke as Jesus gives the instructions that they will fish for people. Here again, we find the disciples with Jesus. If we recall, Simon's first response was, I am a sinful man, get away from me. Now this response, Simon jumps in the water and swims towards him. So let's talk a little bit about this. There are some very important details for us, but it's so important that we can't overread it or read into things. We have to be able to take God's word right for what it is because like other scriptures, people like to cherry pick or they like to take things and they like to uh, really influence it and to have an entirely different meaning. So John 21 is important as an encore, if you will, This scene, as we have just read, of Jesus coming to the disciples as they're again on the Sea of Galilee, as they were in the beginning. This whole emphasis is the third time Jesus revealed himself to the disciples. But why is that important? Early on, they believed that Jesus was just some sort of hallucination for the disciples. He was just some kind of spiritual vision. But right here... On this shoreline is the physical, tangible Jesus Christ who is calling out to the disciples, who has made a fire, who, if you didn't know this, makes the very first supper or first breakfast. We have the last supper, now we have the first breakfast. And Jesus comes to the disciples. This sign, this miraculous catch of fish. And I love this, that as Simon Peter and the disciples are fishing once again, and there are so many people who like to say, well, they just, they spent three years with Jesus, and they're like, oh, well, I guess it's time to go back to our old ways. But no, here the disciples, if we remember the last time we heard or talked about them, they were in the upper room, they were fearful. But Christ has has come and revealed himself, and now the fear is gone. Jesus has defeated sin and death. They have no more fear, and so they are going out fishing. Simon's like, hey guys, I'm going fishing. Simple as that. And so seven of the disciples are out fishing. And I absolutely love the scene as they were fishing And there's a very important technique to the fishing that was taking place in Galilee, and much in the same way it takes place today. They're about 100 yards off the shoreline, and it wouldn't be unusual for whoever is on the water to have a spotter on the shore. The disciples, as they fished all night, and the reason they fished at night is so that the fish would be fresh for the morning to take to market and so on and so forth. But here the disciples fished, nothing. And then, in the haze of the morning, they hear, have you caught anything? No. And Jesus says, lay your nets down on the right side of the boat. They pulled up a lot of fish. And John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, said, It's Jesus. He knew right away without the shadow of a doubt, it's Jesus. Peter put on more clothes. This isn't another, uh, for our Wednesday night Bible study, this isn't another naked person in the Bible. Mark, we studied, uh, we've been studying how Mark runs away naked in the garden. Peter was in, he was in very limited clothes because of fishing, but so he puts on the rest of his clothes and he dives in the water and he swims to shore. Think about that. The very first time that Jesus came to the disciples, he's sitting in Simon Peter's boat, proclaiming the word of God, and in the end, as they catch fish, Simon says, I'm a sinful man. Get away. (laughs) Leave my presence. But here, Simon jumps in the water to pursue the Lord. He has an affirmation, and and we know that Simon Peter denied Jesus. We're going to get into a lot of that next week as we finish out John chapter 21. But three years ago, Peter was saying, get away from me, and now he's saying, it's the Lord, and jumps in and swims after him. With zeal, Peter swims to the shore, and the other disciples, with a net full of fish, 153 to be exact, follow in. Now, 
if you're anything like me, which some of you are, some of you aren't, some of you might not care about this little tidbit, what is it with 153 fish? I mean, if I was fit, I'd be happy with one, right? But there's 153. And so I want to read to you, I want to I cite from William Barclay. This is some of the thoughts over the years, okay, of what the 153 mean. Cyro of Alexandria said that the number 153 is made up of three things. First, there is 100, and that represents the fullness of the Gentiles. 100, he says, is the fullest number. The shepherd's full flock is 100, as we read in Matthew 18, 12. The seed's full fertility is 100-fold. So 100 stands for the fullness of the Gentiles who will be gathered into Christ. Second, there is 50, and 50 stands for the remnant of Israel who will be gathered in. Third, there is three, and three stands for the Trinity, to whose glory all things are done. Augustine had an ingenious explanation. He says that ten is the number of the law, and there are ten commandments. Seven is the number of grace, for the gifts of the Spirit are sevenfold. Thou the anointing Spirit art, who does thy sevenfold gifts impart. Now seven plus ten makes seventeen, and one fifty-three is the sum of all the figures. One plus two plus three plus four up to 17, thus 153 stands for all those who either by law or by grace have been moved to come to Jesus Christ. And there's another simple explanation by Jerome. He said that the sea, in the sea there was 153 different kinds of fish and that the catch is one which includes every kind of fish and that therefore the number symbolizes the fact that someday all men of the nations will be gathered together to Jesus Christ. We may note a further point. This great catch of fishes was gathered into the net, and the net held them all and was not broken. The net stands for the church, and the church is a room for all men and all nations, even if they all come in. The church, she is big enough to hold them. What John is telling us, Barclay goes on to say, in his own vivid, subtle way, is the universality of the church. There's no kind of exclusiveness. This is the beginning of no more Jew, no more Gentile. The embrace of the church is the love of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And that is what we see in Peter as he was drawn to the land. Now, those are some very traditional, I end quote there with William Barclay and all the others. Now, when I read these different possibilities, there remains still one plausible explanation. And personally, you can make up your own mind. That's why I put those different versions in front of you, what the 153 means. But this is where my conviction, this is where I come, this is where the Lord brought me. And I want to share this with you. The disciples, they had fished all night and they caught nothing. Jesus came in the morning, told them to cast on the right of the boat, and bam, 153 fish. This was yet another sign for the disciples, and I believe even indeed for us today, that Jesus has been resurrected. These fish are 153 reasons to believe that Jesus Christ is who He really said He is. The Son of God who gave his life for ransom for ours. When the disciples reached the shore, Jesus already had the fire going with some fish and bread cooking. And what happens next, we're going to cover next week. So, what do we do with all of this? What do we do with this fishing story? I know some of you are probably not thinking about fishing when it's raining outside. But how do we take what happens here on the shoreline of Galilee and apply it to our lives? Might I suggest, and I truly believe, that this story is the very real reality that God meets us right where we are. 
That's the core of Jesus' life. That's the core of the gospel, that Jesus meets us right where we are. But God doesn't come to meet us right where we are so that we can stay the same. Each one of the disciples had a, a different kind of response in following Jesus here. We see that vividly in Simon Peter. He jumps off the boat to swim to Jesus. We're going to see even, even more vividly next week. He comes to give life and to transform us. It totally counters what we hear in popular culture. God just loves me for who I am. I can live and do whatever I want. God is going to forgive me. He is a God of grace. And blah, 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 on and on and on. You know the cheap grace route that a lot of people take and justify a sinful life? But right here, God is meeting the disciples. He's, he's meeting us to not let us remain in some sort of sinful life. But he's calling us for transformation, and that transformation comes in and through knowing and believing and living out that Jesus Christ died on a cross for us, that he was buried in a tomb. Which, by the way, if you didn't get any of these connecting points from Easter and before, I mean, where, where did Adam and Eve sin? What was it? A, it was a tree, right? What was Jesus crucified on? A tree, right? Where did Adam and Eve sin? In a garden. Where was Jesus' tomb? In a garden. Jesus redeemed the tree. Jesus redeemed the garden. Jesus has come to redeem not just the disciples and commission them, but he's done and wants to do the same in and through you and me and each and every single one of us. So this morning, if you need 153 reasons to believe, it's right here, brothers and sister. May we believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you in these moments of your word. And as you encounter your disciples, Lord, in the Sea of Galilee, which is still there today, God, I pray very tangibly for us that we would take away the reality that you have defeated sin and death. That you just didn't come back to life and show yourself once and say, see you later. But Lord, that you, for the third time, and we're going to see as we continue on, Lord, multiple times, hundreds and hundreds of people. Come to see, come to know you, not only as the Lord and Savior who's given his life as a ransom upon the cross, but has given life in the resurrection. And so I pray, God, for each of us here and now that we would sit in your word, that you would move through your Holy Spirit, that you would convict us, that you would help us, Lord, to have a repentful heart that we would come forth knowing that you desire transformation. And may it be for us 153 reasons today to go and share of this good news. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I'd invite you to stand.